This is neptunium, or more precisely, a neptunium containing solution. Unfortunately, this solution is so highly diluted that I cannot show you the green blue color of tetravalent neptunium in solution. Fortunately, we have another sample, a remnant of another experiment. If I understand the lab journal correctly, neptunium of an unknown oxidation state was treated with triflic acid here. So, what are we talking about today? Neptunium's role in nuclear reactors, including its production, and a brief overview of neptunium and as always the decay data. The two important neptunium isotopes are neptunium-239 and, more importantly, the neptunium-237. Let's proceed chronologically in the production. The short-lived neptunium-239, with a half-life of 2.35 days, is the daughter nucleus of uranium-239, which is formed by bombarding uranium-238 with neutrons during the reactor operation. Neptunium-239 decays into plutonium-239. This short-lived neptunium isotope doesn't have much more relevance to it, other than it being involved in the earlier stages of the transuranium element synthesis through neutron bombardment. Due to its short half-life, neptunium-238 can be neglected in burn-up and disposal. Neptunium-237, as the daughter nucleus of americium-241, is much more interesting. It has a half-life of 2.14 million years. Though it doesn't have direct applications through neutron irradiation, neptunium-238 can be produced, which is used to produce plutonium-238, which is needed for radionuclei thermoelectric generators. Therefore, NASA has a significant interest in this. Since neptunium-237 is a distinct element and long-lived, it can be relatively easy extracted from various other irradiation products. Here I've brought a paper where the experimental determination of the amounts of various fission products in the case of a reactor meltdown was conducted. Let's briefly note that they used 200 to 250 grams of corium spent nuclear fuel material for this experiment. The activity they have worked with, it is absolutely insane. And the results show that the little bit of neptunium produced during nuclear reactor operation is not released even in the case of a reactor meltdown. But 200 grams of corium, 10 grams have like a contact dose rate of 1 Z watt an hour. This is absolutely insane. I can't get over it. Okay, let's go to the decay data. Here's the gamma spectrum. You can see lines from neptunium and the daughter nucleus, protactinium-230, alongside a bunch of XRF lines that I haven't marked. While we don't have a pure neptunium alpha source, this is a triple alpha source, including americium and curium. I've already made a video about that. More importantly, the low energy range of this spectrum. We can see two peaks. The main peak is at 4788 kilo electron volts and a much smaller one on the left. That's the 4665 kilo electron alpha energy with a probability of around 3%. I didn't capture this spectrum myself. I dug it out of a very old protocol that we have flying around. There are many more alpha energies associated with the decay of the neptunium-237. Here I've condensed the decay scheme to show only the two alpha peaks that I showed previously in the spectrum. Important data again, half-life 2.144 million years, specific activity 26 megabecquerel per gram. That is not really high compared to other radionuclides that I've already presented here. It decays into productinium-233 via alpha decay and spontaneous fission has an extremely low probability of 2 times 10 to the minus 10%. Here's a picture of a 6 kilogram neptunium sphere. To make the whole situation even better, this is not just any bowl. <laughs> this bowl is made from highly enriched uranium as it was a part of a criticality test for neptunium. I've linked the paper in the description of course. A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, goodbye.